Thank you. Good morning, everyone. So yeah, today I want to talk to you about learning. So why do I want to talk about learning? To answer that question, first I need to show you a quote from Philip Palmer. <coughs> Technical difficulties. Good. Uh, Philip Palmer, uh, who says that our job is not to build a system, it is to acquire the necessary knowledge to build a system. In other words, our job is to learn. We get a similar story from the lean startup build, measure, learn cycle. We need to learn how to solve the problems of our customers and users. So learning seems to be quite central to what we are doing in software development. However, how much do we really know about learning? And are we using what science tells us about learning to build organization where we have really effective learning experiences? The first thing I think we fail to recognize is that learning in itself is a skill. So we can get better at it. We can learn about learning. And that, in a nutshell, is why I want to talk to you about learning. I would describe myself as a lifelong learner. I like to learn things every day if I can. How many of you, quick show of hand, would also describe themselves as lifelong learners? Lots of learners in the room? Awesome. So you guys are experts, you probably saw this guy come into the room the moment I did my introduction. Why? Because I'm here standing, speaking, and you're here sitting and listening. That's probably not the most effective learning experience we can create today. Why? Because learning is not something you do when you're passive. You need to be active when you're learning. You need to be really involved in the learning for it to really stick. So I would want to involve all of you today, and the way I'm going to do that is that throughout this talk, I will give you some small, very short, one-minute sessions where I will ask you to pair up with someone and to discuss a question together. And you might have guessed that we are starting right now with this question. So please find someone, introduce yourself if you don't know each other, and ask yourself, why does learning matter to you? Why did you come to this talk about learning and not another talk? And one minute starts now. <laughs> Banner who took their work and applied it to nursing. What this model tells us is that when we are learning a skill, a skill could be a programming language, facilitation skills, coaching skills, leadership, whatever you're trying to get better at, we go through five stages. The first one is when we are a novice. As a novice, we need a recipe. We need someone who can give us some rules that we can just apply without thinking too much about it. After that, we'll become an advanced beginner. As an advanced beginner, we start to understand a little bit those rules, but still not so much, and we still really heavily rely on them. Then the third stage is when we are competent. Competent, then we start to 
really understand those rules, we start to be goal-oriented, we understand what we're doing, we're still relying on those rules, on those recipes, but we make a decision on which one we want to apply. Then there's a big shift that starts to operate in the next stage, the pre-efficient stage. At that stage, we start to go away from those rules and to start to rely on our intuition. We also develop what Dreyfus called maxims. Maxims is a kind of guiding principle, some high-order high level description who can, which can help us deal with even novel situation, new context. And at the last stage, when we are an expert, then the rules, we don't remember them anymore. We just rely solely on our intuition. So I'm going a little bit fast on this model. The main thing I want you to remember is this progression, this journey from rules and recipe to intuition. So what does that mean if we apply that, this model, to a team or an organization who is trying to become agile? On well, something like that, Scrum, which is a bunch of rules, a recipe. So I know there is lots of liberty in that recipe, there is lots of blanks, there is still a lot which is left to our own decision making, but it's still a bunch of rules. This will work really well when we begin. For novice and advanced beginner, this is perfect. This will work really well. But we need, if we want to continue on our journey to go beyond those rules, to start to develop those maxims, such as those maxims from modern agile, a couple of guiding principles that then will form our decision. We're not relying on rules anymore, we're just looking at that to make our decision. The interesting thing is that if we give that to beginners, to novice or advanced beginners, they will understand the words, but they might not know what to make out of it. So how do we go from novice to expert? How do we fast track this journey from Scrum to modern agile, or just in general, from novice to expert? The first thing I want you to recognize is what not to do. And that is standardization. Arnold Tondi, who is a historian, tells us that civilizations in decline are consistently characterized by a tendency towards standardization and uniformity. I think we can apply that also to organizations. When we start to hit roadblocks, when we start to hit problems, we really quickly want to add more rules, add new standards. The problem with that is two things. The first is that by doing that, we are actually um, annoying our experts and, uh, and proficient people. The best people in the organization do not need rules. They will not react, react very well to that. The second thing is that by letting those rules stay as standards, we actually stop everyone from learning. We stop everyone to go beyond those rules, to bend them, what Dreyfus tells us we need to do. So what we need to do? Dreyfus models speak about experiences and not experience. This is a big difference here. Why? Because we could be doing something for 5, 10, 15, 20 years and still be a novice. There is no correlation between the amount of time and where we are for a skill in Dreyfus. So what are those experiences then? Experiences are novel situations. Different situation with different context. Situation where those rules will not apply anymore. We will be forced outside of our comfort zone, where we will start to need to generalize and develop or use those maxims. To be more effective, those experiences will also need to challenge us. Again, we want to be outside of our comfort zone. We want to deal with situations where we are not in the comfort of our rules and our standards. The problem with that, I feel, is that very often organizations fail to provide those experiences and challenges. My first job as a software developer, after five years, I just had to quit because there was no more experiences and challenges for me, and I felt I stopped learning. I needed to do something. So don't quit your job yet, <laughs> but rather, again, with a partner, ask yourself, what can you do to create more experiences and challenges for you or others? And I'm calling to all leaders in the room to really think about others. And one minute starts again now. So what, what's wrong
So the other thing we might think is, those experiences, do they need to be successful? Is it okay if some of them are mistakes or failures? Do we learn from those? We have this saying in the community that failing is learning. We are learning from our mistakes. Or are we? Don't uh, misunderstand me. I fully believe in this failing is learning. I do believe we need to create organization with a culture where it's safe to fail, where we can make mistakes, because we do learn from mistakes. But that's just a belief. Again, what I want to ask is, what does the science tell us? And what the science says to this question, can we learn from our mistakes? It's not really a clear answer. Some research actually shows that we learn much more from our success than from our failures, or from our mistakes. Some other research shows that actually we can learn as much from our mistakes than from our uh, success in our brain. But there is a condition to that. The condition is that we need to be aware that we are making a mistake. We need to be aware that something should be different. And what's interesting to me is if we put that in relation to this Dreyfus model, this Dreyfus model tells us that unless we're proficient or expert, we are actually not able to detect that we are making mistakes. Only when we are at the later stage, stages of that model can we detect our own mistakes and self-correct. Before that, we can't do it. So how can we learn from our mistakes before that stage? That's where feedback is really important. We need some kind of feedback mechanisms, either from a third party, someone else who is more experienced than us, who can give us some feedback, or from data. That's why when we are experimenting, it's very important that we have a couple of measures, a couple of data that can tell us, are we making a mistake? Is there something we need to learn there? Because else we might not learn from it. The other question you might ask yourself is, does talent play a role? I mean, certainly in this Dreyfus model, going from novice to experts, some people are more talented, they go faster than others. Right? We might have this kind of thinking. But to explore that, I want to tell you a little story. This is a picture I took from Norway. I lived with my wife seven years in Norway. And when moving to Norway, we both had to learn a new language, the Norwegian language. Me, after seven years, I'm still uh, not really there yet. My wife, she learned Norwegian in just one year. In one year, she was fluent. And when she was meeting people in the street, some friends, also foreigners, who also had to learn Norwegian, they would in general tell her, oh, you're so lucky. You are so talented. It's, you've learned this language so fast. I wish I could be like you. It sounds like quite good compliments. But actually, for some reason, those compliments really, really angered my wife. <laughs> Why? Because what people didn't realize is that in this one year where she learned Norwegian, she actually spent eight to ten hours every day, even on the weekend, working on the Norwegian language. And that's why she learned it so fast. And when people were praising her talent, her abilities, what they were also doing is completely discarding all the hard work she had put into it. And that was what uh, really angered her. And this is something we do very often. We tend to regard other people's hard work as just talent. We make excuses. We say, uh, it's not that we haven't worked hard enough, it's just those people are talented. And we're not. It's nothing we can do about it. It's not our fault. We have those nice little excuses. The problem with that is that this is a quite wrong approach to take. And while we are doing that, I started to find some answers in this book 
from Professor Carol Dweck, Mindset. Carol Dweck started to do some research about how people cope with challenges. How she did that, she actually asked 10 years old to do some puzzles, some problems, which were slightly difficult for them. And she saw two different type of reaction from those children. Some children really loved it. They loved what they were doing. They thought, oh, this is great. I'm learning a lot from this challenge. Even though I don't manage to succeed, even though I don't manage to solve this puzzle, I'm learning a lot. But for some of the kids, the experience was quite traumatizing. They actually thought that not managing to solve those puzzles was a direct uh, show on their intelligence, showed that they were not clever enough and they didn't like it. From this research and other, Carol Dweck concluded that we have broadly two types of mindset, a fixed mindset and a growth mindset. In a fixed mindset, we think that uh, our skills is something that we are born with. We either have talent or we don't. In a growth mindset, we believe that skills come from hard work. It's by putting efforts and hard work that we become good at something. So we don't have one or the other. You can have, I can have a growth mindset about my coaching skills, my facilitation skills, but have a fixed mindset about my drawing abilities. I just can't draw, I have no talent for it. What's interesting is the other attributes Carol Dweck found in this research on those two mindsets. Those attributes you might recognize is all what I told you about with Dreyfus. All what we need to go faster with Dreyfus, those challenges, this effort, this feedback we really need to learn from our mistakes. In a fixed mindset, we actually shy away from that. We don't want it. Because if our abilities are fixed, if we are born with certain abilities, having something that challenges us or requires more effort is just a sign that we are not as talented as we thought. Well, when we show a growth mindset, it's the complete opposite. We know that to be good at something, we need to put a lot of effort. We appreciate feedback as something we can learn from, and we totally embrace this challenge as just the way to learn. So this doesn't seem very new. This growth mindset seems very similar to something we call continuous improvement. And we've been doing it for a while in the industry, so we should be really good at it. We should all have a growth mindset by now. So I want you to do a little introspection. And I want you to look in the past one to two weeks at work and try to find a time where you avoided a challenge. Or try to find a time where you didn't put much effort into something. Or a time where you got defensive when you got some feedback. Or simply some time where you made an excuses instead of challenging yourself or putting more effort. Just give you a few seconds for that. You don't have to share it. <laughs> Do you find something? Yes? All of you? Interesting. How come we so easily find those instances where we actually display the fixed mindset at work? And you might tell me, well, but this instance we found is not so relevant. More often we have a growth mindset, we still do continuous improvement, so these fixed mindset examples we find, they are small and they happen in a very specific context. And you know what I would tell you about that? Well, I think you're making excuses. And we need to stop making those excuses, because if we continue making those excuses, we actually strengthen this fixed mindset. This fixed mindset that stops us from learning. So we should stop doing that. How can we do that? Well, that's up to you. And what I would ask you to discuss now is what can we do to be more proactive, to be active in developing this growth mindset and this continuous improvement, to go away from shying away from challenges, to not be defensive when we get feedback, and to stop making excuses. Again, one minute.
Please, please uh, again send me your answers. So I'll give you some tips. The first thing is I really encourage you to read that book. Actually, uh, Satya Nadella, the new CEO of Microsoft, gave, gave that book to read to all of his executives. Again, as a way to strengthen this growth mindset in the organization. Another thing I started doing is, whenever I start working with a team now, the first thing I do is to have a workshop on this growth mindset. We speak about it and we create some artifacts, some posters or create some sentence, something we can point back at. So that when one of us uh, show this fixed mindset, we can point back at it and say, look at what we're doing. Another thing Carl Dweck tells us is the way we praise others and ourselves is really important. We tend to praise abilities. We tend to praise intelligence. We say, hey, look at all what we accomplished, all the value we delivered to our customer. We are great. We're so good at it. The problem when we say that is that what our brain also registers is, well, if we would not have success, that means we are not great. That means we are not clever. So a better way to praise is to actually praise the process we go through. And to tell ourselves, well, if we were so successful, if we delivered so much value to our customers, it's because we didn't shy away from challenges, it's because of all the multiple experiences we created, the experiment we went through. That's why we're successful, because when we praise that, we actually strengthen this growth mindset. Another thing Carol Dweck speaks about is what she calls the power of yet. Changing the way we speak. We tend to speak in terms of binary. You're good or bad. That's how we evaluate ourselves. At school, we pass or we fail. We even have, if some of you are using the Spotify health check, that's green, yellow, or red. It's good or it's bad. A better way to look at things is to use, to use this yet. We're not there yet. This way we project ourselves in the future and tell ourselves, well, we know we have to put some more efforts, but we know we'll get better at what we are doing. We know it will happen. Again, we, have, we are strengthening growth instead of speaking about our current abilities. Same thing what we started to do with some of the teams I work with is to have a, what we call a backlog of we call not yet. So each time someone in the team finds something that the team is not there yet or they want to be better at, just write it down and put that on this backlog. And from time to time, we look at this backlog and we say, ask ourselves, okay, what are we going to learn today? Where are we going to grow? And we use this backlog for that. The question I started to ask myself a lot is actually, if all of us seems to express this fixed mindset so often, there might be, it's maybe not something wrong with us, it's probably something wrong with the organization we work with, the systems we are part of. So I really encourage you to ask yourself this question. I'll give you what I think is my biggest pet peeve right now, and that's performance management. <laughs> Why? Because performance management in general, maybe you're doing it differently, is a way to look at current abilities. Are you good or are you bad? There's not really any notion of how much you've improved. If we really believe in continuous improvement, if we really have the growth mindset, your current ability is totally irrelevant. The only thing that matters is how much you've learned, how much you've improved. Think about those people we tend to call high performers, those whose scores really are high on those performance management systems. They stay high all the time. Are they really learning? Are they really improving? When things will change, will they still be there? Is that really the culture we need to create? I think, well, I think we should get rid of those performance management, but if we really want to look at something, the only thing we should look at is how much everyone has improved. If everyone is growing, if everyone is improving, as a whole, the organization naturally will improve. 
As Benjamin Barber says, we need to stop dividing the world in the weak and strong, the successes and the failure, those who make it or those who don't, but only into the learner and the non-learners. Who are the people who are learning, and who are the people who are not learning yet, but who will, if we provide the correct culture? Same for hiring. Very often we say, we need to hire smart people. No, you don't. You need to hire people who can learn, and put them in a culture which promotes learning. Then they will naturally improve. To go a bit further on this growth and fixed mindset, this is my favorite movie, Kanaka. Uh, it's a science fiction movie put in a dystopian future. A future where the progress of genetics allowed us to create people with the best abilities possible, with the best talent. And those who have not been created like that are considered that they can't do anything, they don't have talent, they have not been genetically engineered. This is a story of a guy who has a growth mindset and who lives and struggles in this society, which is a society completely um, looking at this fixed mindset and promoting it. Only abilities, only the way we are born is important. When I watched this movie the first time, as any good dystopian movie, I thought, well, I hope this is not the future. I hope this will never happen. Now when I look at it, I find myself wondering that, actually, this is not the future. This is the present. We already live in a society and in an organization who are constantly promoting this fixed mindset, who look at abilities and talent instead of looking at how much are we growing and how can we promote growth in our organizations. I've been going a bit fast, but before I wrap up, before we have plenty of time for questions, I want to ask you a last question today, two actually, is from this talk, what have you learned today? And more importantly, how you are going to use that knowledge tomorrow in your organizations? I can give you even two minutes because this is so important. <laughs>
Um, this is the first time I'm showing that, so please, for me to learn, I also need feedback, so give me tons of feedback about that. The first thing is really involve people in their own learning. Let's stop having those endless meetings in our organization where one person is talking and everyone else is listening. This is not a good way to transmit information. This simply does not work. Continuously seek new experiences and challenges. This is what we need to get better at what we are doing. Praise wisely. Don't praise your intelligence or other people's intelligence or their talent. Praise the process they go through. Praise the hard work they put into what they are doing. Stop making excuses. This is the hardest thing for me, I know. I'm making excuses all the time. When I worked on this presentation, I had to work uh, on the weekends. And each time I found a nice excuse not to work on that presentation. It's nice when we're outside, there's this new video game coming, oh, I have time, no problem. Uh, when we make excuses, it's just that we're afraid. I was afraid to put more work and to challenge myself into making this presentation. That's what it really is. But we need to stop making those excuses, else we don't learn. Instead, let's use yet. Let's just say that we need, we're not there yet, we need to put more effort into what we're doing. And more importantly, continue to develop this Agile mindset. Why am I calling that Agile mindset? Because I'm a huge fan of Linda Rising. And in the community, she's probably the first one who talked about the research of Carol Dweck. And she, instead of calling that the growth mindset, she called that the power of an Agile mindset. Why? Because this growth, this learning, this is exactly what Agile is about. It is about learning. We were not born with abilities, with talent. We were born to learn and to grow and improve. And as Einstein put it, once you stop learning, you start dying. So please try to live really long. <laughs> and think that this is true for us as individuals but it's also very true for organizations. Thank you.